Hi, thank you so much for having, <laughs> thank you so much for having me today. This is so much fun. Um, thank you so much also to um, Chikendi for really, really nice words um, in the beginning. Um, yes, it was junior high when we first <laughs> know each other. Um, seems like such a long time ago. I feel like very old um, right now. But um, thank you so much for a very um, enlightening um, performance and also a, a very exciting um, lecture as well. So um, today I am um, technically, wait, let me just share my screen really quickly. Uh, so basically for me, it's um, this piece I played um, quite a long time ago, actually. I, I, I did it as one of my uh, degree recitals back when I was still at Eastman, uh, trying to finish my doctorate. But uh, it took me a really, really long time uh, to decide to play this piece because I think um, it's one of the most uh, difficult, I think, of Chopin's music. And not just because technically it is very demanding as you can probably already see in the performance, but also in terms of understanding the music itself. So um, without further ado, um, I just, I have a couple of things about, about, about this sonata that I want to share with all of you. Uh, but the first one, I always like to start with a quote and, um, this one is Chopin's own uh, writing. And he said, music is the expression of thoughts through sounds, the revelation of emotions by means of these sounds. Sounds are used to create music just as words are used to create language. Um, I find this quote very, very um, profound, I think, in, in, in a sense, because um, ultimately, I always think that music is, it is a language, it is a way for us to communicate one to another. And then so for me, it is very important for us to always want to communicate, always um, want to try to transmit uh, some sort of an information from, from the performer um, to the listener. And in this sense, it is very important for us to understand what we are performing or else then we are not going to be able to actually express um, the things. There is no revelation of emotions if we do not really understand what we're actually doing. So um, in this sense, in, in this particular sense, um, I have a couple of things that I, I do want to highlight. Um, this sonata, especially the first one, um, is that it is a structural work more than anything. When, when you hear the word sonata, it's always implies that it is structural. There is some, some sort of a um, expectation as um, Ko Johannes was, was saying, it's um, there is this idea that you want, you, you sh you're supposed to understand, you're supposed to go into it with an expectation. Uh, but it is really, really funny because uh, Chopin is not known for his sonata. I mean, he only wrote three, the first one uh, very rarely played, and then the second and the third one are the more um, popular one, but I, 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 I have this quote uh, by this guy uh, called Gerald a Abraham. Um, he wrote this book called Chopin's Musical Style back in 1941. And then he said this, uh, Chopin's form is generally considered to be his weakest point. It was also the weakest point of all of his contemporaries, <laughs> um, which is hilarious in my mind. And then, and of course, compared with Beethoven's. But then again, it is a, a fantastically unfair comparison. So of course, as, as, as we try to think about stuff, I mean, we, we know right now, at least, it's just like, if we're talking about the standardized idea of a performance, every single time that people talk about Sonata, there are usually, if in piano, we always have the three big names, right? Everybody knows what it is, Haydn, Beethoven, Mozart. Everybody like, oh, I I'm playing a sonata who's Beethoven, Mozart, or Haydn's. No one's ever saying it's like, oh, is it um, Chopin or is it Liszt? Oh, is it Schumann? There is no reference of that to the Romantic era. Um, and I think it's just because the style is changing, but um, to judge 
something based on just the form is, um, as it says, fantastically <laughs> unfair comparison. But it is important for us to kind of like think about this as well. We have to have it in the back of our mind because we are dealing with a structural work. A sonata is a structural work, uh, regardless of whether or not we like it or not. Um, and then the second one is this idea of crafting the idea of an interpretation, knowing that it is a structural work. How do we actually craft um, our own interpretation for this particular piece? Um, that is in one, 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 one hand, I guess. Uh, the one that um, Ko Johannes was, was talking about is the idea of understanding form, understanding harmony, understanding all of this type of stuff. But at the same time, I also like to look at the, I guess, the humanity behind these notes. So the importance of getting to know the composer and understanding this person behind the music. Uh, what kind, oops, sorry, I'm next to a piano. Uh, what kind of a composer is Chopin? What's his aesthetic? Like, because we, just like we cannot generalize, oh, every composer is all the same. No, it's, 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 it's that way of communication, right? So every single person have very different way of communicating. So I feel like that is something that we have to take into account. We have to really think about this type of stuff. What type of person is Chopin? In order for us to actually understand, to craft an interpretation, um, of his music. And then the third one, uh, last but not least, is always the performance consideration. So um, all the musical ideas translating. So we have all of these ideas in, in terms of interpretation. How are we tr actually translating it into our performance? Um, musical aspect considerations, of course, it includes tempo, sound, phrasing, color, voicing, timing, all of this type of things. It, it always goes into um, the third part. But I feel like it is it is very important for us to have this approach, I think. Um, the idea that it goes from a structural work if we're working with a sonata, and then we're crafting this idea of interpretation and then how to translate it into the performance. So speaking about Chopin as a person, um, there are a couple of quotes as well. It's just like, because I feel like it is important for us to kind of get to know him um, as a person as well. So the first one is uh, from this book uh, titled appropriately, Chopin, um, written by uh, Arthur Headley in 1947. And then it's, he says that the tone which Chopin drew from the instrument, especially in cantabile passages was immense. A manly energy gave to appropriate passages an overpowering effect, energy without coarseness. But on the other hand, he knew how to enchant the listener by delicacy without affectation. So there is something that seems very natural, right, about Chopin. It's just like his music, um, in this sense, it's just like Chopin is not that type of person that goes like all out, even when it is um, uh, overpowering, but never without uh, energy without coarseness, even when it is overpowering, it is never harsh. So there's there's that aesthetic, right? That that idea of aesthetic that we need to figure out. Um, what type of composer is this person? So um, and then the idea of um, something very delicate, something uh, that is not um, stage. It's it's very natural, something very natural about his own playing. So if we see him as a person, if we see him as a composer that. Uh, goes through that um, idea. We, we see him as that lens, of course, because when, whenever we talk about a composer, like Chopin is a very different person from Beethoven, a very different person from Schumann, very different person from Bach. So we shouldn't be ever treating their music in one way uh, because they're made or written by different person. So we should probably get to know this person a little bit, like what 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 type of character he is. Um, and there are actually a lot of literature um, in which we can actually go about this. Um, and the more that you actually get to know the person, the better your interpretation will be because you kind of understand where does the music actually comes from. It's not just very random things that somebody just put together. Um, and then, of course, the other one is um, Corteau. Uh, I'm sure that most of you over here already know um, Corteau. Uh, he wrote a he wrote a book in 1952 called In Search of Chopin. And then he said, uh, for Chopin, it was essential that his pupils should put the whole of their souls into their playing. And he made this significant remark: music that has no underlying meaning is false. So. 
seeing this, understanding this, the amount of um, commitment, the amount of, how do I want to say this, the amount of uh, investment, I guess, um, both intellectually and uh, emotionally, um, all of this type of stuff, our our soul, it needs to be represented in the music. And uh, for Chopin, it is very important. I'm I'm sure that other people might, other composers might have a different uh, way of thinking about stuff. But for Chopin, um, it is very important for us to play with our souls. So it is not just about um, something very surface level. So it is that idea of trying to assimilate what we have as a performer with what he has um, from the perspective of a composer. So um, also what is really, really exciting guys is the fact that a lot of the manuscript um, is now available even on, uh, even on IMSLP. I used to like nerd out so much about this manuscript because it's it shows us so much about the composer, right? It's just like every single time that we see um, something that looks like um, this, or that, or this. It's always, it's always very interesting to me. It's just like, what is he thinking? Like, what, 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 what mistake did, did he make? Or what was his original intention? Or those type of things is always in my mind. It's always very interesting. So um, it's kind of like getting, getting, getting to know um, the layers of the music itself. But um, speaking about that, um, there is this um, idea that I like to think about a decision derived everything. So um, number one is the addition derived composition. It means that we fullingly know and understand that each composer chose, decided, and meant every single thing that he or she put on the page. So there, it is not a coincidence that he wrote something in B minor or in B major, or that he moves from B minor to D major. It was a very conscious choice. Um, it is also a very conscious choice that he picked a particular harmony. It is very conscious choice, conscious choice that he actually picked um, a particular, for example, a particular um, accompaniment pattern, which actually brings us, I'll, I'll come back to that slide, but which actually brings us, uh, I want to talk about the third movement primarily um, because uh, the first movement is already being taken. So I guess I'll just talk about the third movement. But the idea is that um, I like to think about this third movement because when I was learning this particular piece, um, I had a really, really long, um, very crazy uh, lesson actually with my uh, former teacher back at Eastman. And it actually uh, stems from this idea about this accompaniment pattern. Um, all of this um, dotted uh, thing. Okay, wait. Oh, now it comes. Okay, good. Okay, so there's this dotted uh, thing. It does not come again. <laughs> I don't know in other uh, people. Oh, um, original sound. Original sound. I think mine is already on original oh, sound. Yeah. Yes, uh, I usually do that for. I think Zoom has this new feature that uh, kind of automatically uh, detect or, or make assumptions okay. of the background noise. Yeah, so probably. When you are a little bit away from the piano, they think it's the background noise also. <laughs> Okay. It's okay. I think I think I should stop talking like right before I start playing because I think that's usually that usually happens. So good. Can you guys hear the piano? No piano sound cut off. Okay. Wow. Uh, okay. Well, basically. Well, it's okay. We'll 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 figure it out as it goes. Hopefully, hope hopefully, when I talk, the piano sound. Uh, that means you have to talk. <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> I have to keep talking in order for the piano to actually be heard. Okay, sounds good. I I can try. Um, but uh, I I was I was basically just playing the left hand, and then uh, this idea of a dotted quarter um, accompaniment. Um, 
I experienced the same of using the laptop with the iPad. There's no problem. Okay. Um, Okay. Well, let's 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 see how let's see how this is this is this is working. But the idea is that I was I was I was basically playing the left hand. That's that's what it is. It's just like I was just playing the left hand thumb, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum, pum pum. Basically, I was just playing that. And if we see, it's just like Chopin actually wrote cantabile, um, cantabile. Um, on top of that, on top of that particular phrase. So, but this idea of a dotted uh, rhythm is never actually a cantabile thing, right? It's just like we never thought of a cantabile thing that has a dotted rhythm. Dotted rhythm is always about like energy thumb, pa pum, pa pum, pa pum, pa pum. Cantabile is more like da 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 da. So that idea of rhythm, why is Chopin using this rhythm in particular? So that's why I think that it is a very conscious choice. There is a particular thing that Chopin is trying to achieve by actually using this idea of a dotted um, rhythm. And then so when we actually have this idea of a dotted rhythm, then it is very interesting as to how we actually shape the dotted rhythm itself. Because then the way that Chopin think about a dotted rhythm in cantabile version, that means that it should inform us how to actually play this particular dotted rhythm. So which brings me to our second point, which is a de decision derived interpretation. So knowing that Chopin actually chose a particular way of thinking about stuff. So how are we supposed to bring the music to life? How conscious shall we take our decision making process into crafting an interpretation. So this idea is that I, well, I'm gonna try to play again in a little bit, but the idea is that I would like to feel like the dotted rhythm is probably not as strong as what, let's say other dotted rhythm would be. Um, like something in a classical sonata or something in a that dotted rhythm is completely different than this dotted rhythm. Please do not play this movement like a polonaise. But um, the idea is that it, it is the same rhythm, right? It, 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 is, it is not a different rhythm. Chopin knowingly chose this rhythm. So um, that idea in and of itself, I think is always really interesting. And then um, the idea of it is that Chopin, it's not that Chopin do not know how to make a cantabile accompaniment pattern, for example. Like all of his nocturnes has very cantabile, um, <laughs> very cantabile accompaniment pattern. So why would he not use that here, for example? So that in my mind, it should inform how I would think about how to interpret this particular passage or this particular section or this particular movement. And then from there, and then we will have a decision derived performance. So after you already make decisions on how to actually interpret this, okay, I think I want to do it this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. This is the type of character that I want. This is the type of um, sound that I want. This is the type of, this is how strong the rhythm should be. But then, it goes to the idea of execution. So how much awareness are you actually putting into your own playing to create the so-called interpretation? If we already know that we want to highlight this rhythm, the dotted rhythm, thumb, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I want it that way instead of thumb, ta -ta, ta -ta, ta -ta, for example, something as simple as that. But it's just like, how, how does that translate to your fingers? How, how legato should you play stuff, for example? What would be the voicing that you would want? What type of color are you actually thinking about making um, in order to actually bring out this very important rhythm, for example? But at the same time, it also has, um, it, it, it also keeps the authenticity of what Chopin uh, wanted for example. So um, I'm going to try again to play the piano. If it doesn't work, then, um, well, um, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Um, so for example, this is the... works, you play and you sing. 
that will work. <laughs> okay, I could try. Uh, but basically, this is oh, basically this is the way that um, I I the way that I think about this is that I want the left hand to still maintain that idea of dotted rhythm, but then at the same time, it's still it's it goes with the idea of the cantabile, and then also on top of it, every single time that the harmony changes, probably I would want to do a little bit different of a voicing, maybe balance wise, it would be a little bit different. So I hope it comes through. So we'll see. Yes, it did come through very, very beautifully. Yes, great. <laughs> Yay, okay. So for example, that, that would be the way that I shape the left hand, for example, because I still want to keep that um, idea, that, that rhythmic consistency of the dotted rhythm, but at the same time, trying to make it more of a cantabile fashion. Another thing, for example, that I also like to, um, Speaking about speaking about this type of stuff, it's just like it's always very interesting too about talking about phrasing. For example, it's just like it's not like Chopin doesn't know how to do phrasing, but um, the way that he actually phrased this particular movement is very very interesting. So, for example, like um, right before I stop. Um, oh no, not right before I stop. Actually, as we were keep on going, I, I'm gonna play uh, the next one. But for example, it's this it's this particular um, passage in the bottom. That that would actually keep on going um, to the reiteration of ta 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 ta. So it will it will come back to to the melody in the beginning. But um, for example, this idea, this this particular um, harmonic motion, for example, over here, is always what I feel um, very very interesting. It's not like Chopin doesn't know how to cadence. Um, I'm, I'm very sure that Chopin knows exactly how to cadence, but um, there is this particular thing too that he he could have just do a half cadence over there. Um, so I always like to also play the game of what if. Uh, so Chopin could technically write. Um, oh, sorry, no, not that one. This one. Sorry, 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 sorry. Wrong, wrong one. Why did I? Why did I? Why did I do that one? No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not. It's not. It's not this one. It's the one before. But um, so. So Chopin could have technically written that. He could have just like go from um, five, for example, over here. He could have just gone from five and then go back to one to, to B major, but he didn't. And that's always something that I also find very, very interesting as well. Um, it, it, it really does give uh, a particular choice. He, he, he consciously made this choice. And I think the reason why is because he really wants um, he really wants the two voices coming together. So there's this one and there's that one. And then when the theme comes back, it would actually come back in two voices. That would actually translate into um, the second one because this one, for example, it will have, it will have more of that as well uh, because then we will have um, this one, um, the, the, the underlying voices as well. 
So for example, there's that type of um, conscious decision. Another thing that I feel uh, very interesting about conscious decision is the fact that he actually changed <laughs> that dotted rhythm doesn't stay very long. Um, it goes into triplets at the end, um, which is in my mind, again, it's, it's a very, very conscious choice. And then in this one, and then he, he even writes it down dolcissimo. Um, so I always find that that is in particular, uh, very, very interesting uh, because I think there is this idea of uh, synthesis at the end of the day. It's that um, after everything that has been going on, so the, dip, the, the, the beginning with the idea of this, and then the middle section that has all the triplets in the world. And then, so now when it comes back, again, this is why recapitulation is so important, is that um, no recapitulation should feel ever the same. It, it, it should feel different when you heard that the second time. So um, the same thing with this one is that um, the melody still keeps that. The melody still keeps the dotted rhythm, um, but the accompaniment completely changes it. So um, for example, something, something like this. I know that this seems, oh, I know that this seems um, like small stuff, but I always feel like the smallest things are always the, um, the, the most interesting to think about. So how it synthesizes at the end, how it changes the character at the end, I, I feel like that's the part of the journey, right? It is the part of that musical journey that you take. Something that um, you start somewhere and then you always end up uh, somewhere else. And then just like, even if we're doing the same thing twice, we would not feel it the same way. Um, it, it, it should feel different. Um, and I feel like that's partly, um, that's why it is very important for us to make decisions. It's very important for us to acknowledge the decisions that the composer has made. And it is very important for us to also be very, very conscious about decisions that we make as a performer. So uh, lastly, uh, before, before, before I stop, um, this is also Chopin. <laughs> I found this quote uh, taken from uh, the book, uh, The Legacy of Chopin. It was just published in 2019 uh, by uh, John Holman. I hope I'm not pronouncing his name wrong, but um, I, I found this quote very, 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 very dear to my heart because um, people with empty heads and cold hearts should not waste time on music. The best metronome and the most diligent practicing will be of no avail. Music is more than skillful moving of the fingers. So this is why I feel like it is important for us to get to know him as a person. So Chopin wants you to be thinking. Chopin wants you to feel something when you play. So, um, and if we don't want to be thinking about stuff, if we don't want to be, um, trying to feel, trying to understand emotionally, um, uh, understanding knowledgeably, emotionally, um, where the music is coming from, then I feel like it's probably, <laughs> it's, 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 um, Chopin would be turning in his grave or not, but it, it, it would just be, um, it would just be sad. So, um, I hope that this has been useful. I hope that I'm not uh, over the 20 minute limit that was that was given to me. So um, lastly, um, I invite any questions. If you guys have any questions, this is actually the um, QR for the quiz. So, but we're gonna wait on that, but that's it for me.